Blessed are those who believe and have not seen. That statement, um, what was it? That statement that, that you shared. <laughs> Church, that's, there's some good news there for us. Because we are believers that we have not seen in our, with our physical eyes. And so be encouraged with that today as disciples. Uh, we're those disciples who believe and have not seen. And so stay the course. Keep keep the faith. Keep pushing. Keep keep seeking. Keep reading. Keep praying. Keep doing all those things. Your discipleship grows from here. It doesn't, it doesn't change. It doesn't stop. It doesn't melt away. It, it grows. Every move that we make is a chance to grow our faith and our discipleship. And so I appreciate you sharing that. It's a good word this morning. All right, so I'll pray and give Mom a chance to change the slides while we close our eyes. That's what we do here. And then we'll, we'll get into the Word this morning. Lord, I just ask for open hearts and open eyes. Lord, for each one of us to hear what you've got for us this morning. Lord, let the Holy Spirit minister to our hearts and, and speak to us and tell us, Lord, what it is that you need to speak to each one of us individually. We know that you've got good plans and good purposes, and, and your Word leads us in the right way. In Jesus' name I pray. And we all said, Amen. 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 All right, good timing. So, today, part five of Experiencing Victory in 2023, uh, our final series here at Andrew Church. Today we're talking about loving God and loving people. Love God, love people. That's the fifth piece of this puzzle that we've been kind of putting together. Remember the first four parts, and I'll, I'll go over them again just so we have them in the front of our minds. Four essential pieces to to being victorious in our in our walk in 2023. First was guard your heart. We talked about guarding our heart above all else. The, the psalm says, guard your heart above all else. Then we talked about being authentic so we can be healed. We can't be healed if we're not authentic. We don't go to the doctor for the problem. We can never fix it. But when we're authentic, we can be healed. The third thing was be a giver. Be a giver. Give, give, give. That's that's such a key part of being a Christian is, is giving selflessly. And then last week we talked about do not fear but fear God. And, and we, we talked about that, that uh, seemingly opposite ideas in Scripture that, that work together. By fearing God, we don't fear the world. By fearing God, we don't fear anything that this situation presents to us. And so, yeah, we fear God, but we do not fear His creation. And that leads us to today. Love God and love people. So I heard a pastor once say this, and it struck me, and I, I loved it. And so I want to share it today. Your congregation won't remember your sermon. Like, that's, they just won't. I won't remember the sermon. You won't remember the sermon. Your church won't remember the sermon series. They might even remember the title. They might not remember the illustrations that you shared from your life. They might not remember anything you ever said, but they will remember the way you made them feel. They will remember the love. And I, I really think... That's true in, in our church. That's true in our families. That's true as we go out and minister to the world. People won't remember our words necessarily, but they will remember the way you made them feel. Our words are important. I don't want to change that. That's, our words are critical. The things we say, truth that we share, being biblically accurate in, in our preaching, our speaking, and, and what we believe. Being biblically accurate is, is critically important, but just as important as the truth is presenting the truth in a way that makes people want to seek your Savior, that makes people want to hear Jesus' voice. We can weaponize truth and, and use it to chop people in half, and you wouldn't be wrong. That's the, you wouldn't even be wrong, but you didn't. You weren't able to love someone in their circumstance. Now, I'm saying this in the broadest sense possible, to love someone that's the absolute furthest from Jesus. And, and they're going to have excuses of why you're wrong, and they're going to doubt you, and they're going to tell you, oh, and you're wrong, and you don't know, and, you, and they're going to have everything. But you know what? When we are truly experiencing victory in our faith, that doesn't matter. What matters is that we're extending truth to them in love. And when we walk away from that conversation, they don't walk around saying, another hypocritical, hateful Christian. They walk around, walk away saying, I've never seen Jesus in someone like that before. And now, 
like Cleo mentioned in prayer, now maybe there's something happening. Maybe, maybe now there's a seed planted. Maybe now they're going to seek our Savior the way that, that we once did and, and do now. People will remember the love we showed. They'll remember the integrity we walked with. They'll remember the grace and the mercy that we showed them above every, anything else that we say. So the first scripture I want to show this morning is from Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. And it says this, Jesus replied, You must love the Lord, the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the first and the greatest command, commandment. And the second is equally as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Everything else in Scripture, everything else we read, everything else Jesus said, everything the prophets said, everything in the Old Testament, all of it hangs on this. We, we messed this up. The rest of it's not going to matter. Not that it doesn't matter, but it, it loses its ability to, to be impactful. Jesus said, these are the two most important things we can do. The greatest command, in order to see everything else God wants to do in your life come through, in order to see everything else God wants to do in your life happen, we love God and we love others first. <clears throat> love God and love people. So experiencing your spiritual victory in 2023 will not be measured by personal gains or social statuses or new jobs or new cars or new anything else or anything else the world considers important. Our victory in 2023 will be measured by our personal standing with Christ. Are we one step closer or do we take another step back? What's 2023 going to look like for you? Is it another step closer to Jesus? Yeah. In spite of a new shirt, in spite of uh, all these other things in your heart being broke, whatever, are you taking another step forward? Or are you going to use this as an excuse to, to pull back? Because it's not an excuse to pull back. It's an excuse to take another step forward. Are we growing in holiness? Or are we finding new ways to operate in wickedness? Are we sharing the love of God in a way that draws people to our Savior? Or are we weaponizing the truth to chop down people who don't agree with us? Cause them to stumble and fall further away from Christ. Romans 13.10, if you're not sure about this, Romans 13.10 says, Love does no wrong to others. No wrong to others. So love fulfills the requirements of God's law. If your love for somebody hurts them, <laughs> that's not love. That's, that's you being selfish or being bullheaded or, or arrogant or whatever, fill in the blank. Because the kind of love that God wants us to work with, church, does no harm to others. Even those who don't want to hear truth. Our love will do no harm to them. Our love, our love won't chop them down with the edge of the word. You know, it says the word is a two-edged sword. But we're not called to swing that sword on, on unbelievers. We're not called to swing. We're, we're in the church, yeah, we, you might swing a sword on somebody because they're falling into some lies and, and walking in deceit or somebody that should know better. But in the world, we don't swing a sword. We build a bridge. We don't throw bombs. We, we, we make connections. Because nobody's going to come to Christ because you were harsh, because you took your sword out. We've proven that over the history of the world. No matter how accurate your, your theology is, no matter how true the words you speak are, it's not going to bring anybody to Christ if it's presented in a way that doesn't show love. Randy shared this verse last week, and as he was sharing this last week, I was like, oh man, he's a week ahead of me. But he nailed it. And I wanted to share a verse that he shared again um, out of 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. It says, if I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but I didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I had to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. 
I would have gained nothing. Paul says nothing. You, you told people about Jesus. You gave all you had to the poor. You, set, you went on mission trips. You did all this. But your motivation wasn't love. You're no different than anybody else who, who is far from Christ. Paul doesn't say a lack of love diminishes our impact. Look at this. He doesn't say without love it will weaken what you're able to do. It says without love nothing will matter. Without love nothing will be gained. It eliminates, Paul says it eliminates. Doing these things without love eliminates this impact. We become nothing. No love means no, nothing else matters. Your love controls your spiritual life. The amount, how, how you love others, how you love the world, how you go out and present this truth will, will control your spiritual life. It will control your ability to minister to others. If you're ministering to others out of obligation, out of even obedience, out of whatever motivation you have besides love, we're going to miss the point. We're going to miss the purpose. And according to this, it isn't even going to matter. So let me just say this. Whether you're the pastor, the elder, the greeter at the front door, the person who makes snacks, the person who scrubs the toilets, the person who sweeps the carpet in the church, whatever role you fill in your church, your motivation to do that is love. And that's your only motivation. Love is our why. Does that make sense? Why do you do it? Because I love. I love Christ and I love his church. Why are you why are you willing to scrub toilets every stuff? Because I love Christ and I love his church. Why do you plow the snow? Why do you salt the salads? Why do you whatever? Because I love Christ and I love his church. That's the only reason why. It's not to impress you. <laughs> it's not it's not to make you more comfortable. It's because I love Christ and I love his church. So I'd like to take a second here this morning and talk a little bit about, specifically about what kind of love the Bible talks about when it talks about this kind of love. The kind of love that pushes us to do all these things for Jesus. And the Bible gives us a distinct word for this kind of love, and that word is agape. You've probably heard this word, agape. <clears throat> agape is a word rich in meaning, rich in and, and what it brings, it's a lot. The word agape brings a lot with it. Uh, it takes us beyond the superficial, I love pizza, or, or I love my truck, or I love the lions, or, or uh, whatever. That, that kind of love that we talk about most commonly, literally means nothing. That's, that's just, I like I really like it. it, it I like it personally. That's, that's not agape love. That's not anything to do with the kind of love that, that the Bible talks about. People love lots of things, they think. We think we love a lot of things. A lot of things that we shouldn't love, to be honest. Agape love does not mean romantic love. It doesn't mean we want to be in a relationship. It doesn't mean that we're... Uh, it's not about sentimental love. It's not about physical love. You know, there are words in the Greek language for all those different kinds of love. For example, eros. Eros is the, the sexual attraction kind of love that a married couple would have. That's eros. That's the kind of love that takes. That, that eros takes from someone. Okay, then there's, there's, there's a phileo. Phileo is brotherly love. That's the love of a best friend. That love gives and takes, right? A good friendship gives and takes. That's what phileo, phileo gives and takes. And then there's, there's agape. And agape love, all it does is give. It doesn't give and take. It doesn't just take. It just gives. Agape love just gives. And it's never an emotional thing. It's not a tingling sensation, butterflies in your belly kind of thing. It doesn't mean just being good friends. It doesn't mean being hospitable or cordial. It's not talking about being tolerant of things. It's not even talking about being kind. King James uses the word charity when it talks about agape love. And, and I'm not knocking anything, but charity doesn't even do the word justice. Charity implies giving something to a poor person or, or helping somebody in need. Agape is even more than that. I think, I think charity is too narrow. 
So when we talk about agape, when we talk about this kind of love, church, that the, the church is supposed to operate in and, and live out this agape love, this biblical love, we're talking about an act of selflessness. Selfless sacrifice. So God so loved the world that he did what? He gave. He gave. He loved the world so much he just gave. Is it because he knew that we'd bring, maybe be with him at some point? No. Obviously, we can't make be with God. Did he give because he was, because the, somebody pushed him to do it or somebody made him do it? No. Did, did another God upstairs say, hey, you should really do this, and he, he was pressured? No. He's the only God. And the only reason he gave his son to die on a cross for you is because he loves you. That's the only motivation he had. And that's more than enough motivation for us. Think about Jesus in the upper room with his disciples. And we read about it today over communion. He was in the upper room. And, and what did Jesus do in, in chapter 13 of the book of John? It says he loved them to the max. And I'm going to share this scripture, John 13. 1. It says, before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth. And now... He loved them to the very end. And if you click on the little three dots there at the end of that, it brings up this second part. It says, he showed them the full extent of his love for them. He loved them to the max. He copied them as much as he could have copied somebody. Like, he poured it all out and, and, and served them by washing their feet. And again, not because he was, he was compelled to do it, not because he wanted to get paid back or because it was his turn. He did it from love. And that was it. He copied them as much as you can copy. <laughs> to the limit. He loved them perfectly, to the perfection. And so when he stooped down to wash their dirty, stinky disciple feet, he was showing love by, by doing an act of service by serving them by giving sacrificially to himself I mean, we've talked about the idea of foot washing before as being <clears throat> yucky I mean I don't know what other word to use there I mean it's gross you wouldn't want to do that too, unless but maybe it was your child or maybe your spouse but but man most people will be caught scrubbing the feet of a stranger who's been walking barefoot around the parking lot all day like it's just <clears throat> not something we would normally be willing to do but here's Christ saying you, you think you've got friends? You think you care about somebody? Would you wash their feet? Would you get on your hands and knees and, and get as low as you can and, and wash their feet? I don't think we really think of God. We don't really take love to the extreme. And this is something we can take to the extreme. I don't think we take agape love to the extreme the way that Jesus maybe intends us to. To the max like he did. It's not just saying nice things. It's not leaving a note. It's not it's, it's selfless servanthood. That's the only way to agape love someone. So, and then before Jesus went to the cross, he stood down and washed the feet. And then later on that night uh, in chapter 15 of John Jesus said this This is my commandment. He was telling his disciples to love each other in the same way that I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Jesus says, you want to know the, the max now? Washing your feet was good. But you want to know the max? That max agape level of love is to be willing to lay down your life for your friends. Lay down your life. Simply stated, this is a selfless sacrifice. It's not something you feel. It's not something that gives you warm and fuzzy every time. It's something you do. It's action. It's, it's putting rubber to the road. It's, it's putting hands on, feet on the ground, boots on the ground kind of love. That, that's what this is about. And here in the final moments of Christ's life, here in the book of John, Jesus had one last lesson for his disciples. And he taught it, he demonstrated it, and then he spoke it. He identified the problem, he addressed the problem, he provides the disciples the solution to the problem. 
love one another. Love one another. Love people. Love them well. Love them hard. Don't, don't stop loving because they don't cooperate. Like, keep loving them. And love them in deed. Love them in action. Love them in the things you do. Not just in a word or idea. And so as, as we leave here today, for the last time we talk those doors, I want you to leave with a feeling. The feeling of being loved. Of being cared for. Uh, of being valued and wanted. <clears throat> and that is the feeling that we should take with us from here. That's the feeling that you can bring to your new, wherever God leads you, and share that. And that can be, you can be the gosh darn most loving person in that building. And they can't believe how loving this person is. And that can be our legacy, church. That can be the unhindered church legacy. Unhindered church can be <clears throat> felt. It won't be seen anymore. It won't be a, a physical thing, but it can be felt. felt your love for others. Alright, so how am I going to look this up? So wherever you go, you go and be the church. And love people in a way that shows them the love of Jesus, the love that gives. So, <clears throat> I'm going to boil this whole thing down to one thing. enough, it's the same thing as Jesus boiled it down to as well. Just love people. Such, so many words. <laughs> so much in here, right? So many words, so many chapters, so many books, and it just comes down to one word, love. And do it well. And don't keep track, and don't keep a, an account of, of how many times you've loved somebody. Just love, and, and keep loving, and that's going to be the thing that people are going to say, all right, this person's got something in their heart. They've got Christ living in them. They've got the Holy Spirit working. And that can be the legacy of, of what we've done here in the last four years. I hope it is. Amen? Amen. All right. If we can open this up. If anybody has a, a word they'd like to